Today, I'm happy to introduce our presenter, Dr. Kali Tal. She's a scientific writing tutor at the medical library, and she has a profound experience in um, teaching of various scientific writing courses and also in scientific editing. Uh, welcome, and thank you for sharing your lunchtime with me. I'm going to talk about a subject that everyone knows at least a little bit about, and some of you may know all about, uh, but I'm going to approach it in a more philosophical fashion. And uh, my favorite thing when I'm teaching and putting together courses is to try to create organized processes. And so what I'm going to share with you today is my organized process for thinking about citing while writing. Um, one of the biggest horrors we all have is reading, which we do a lot of, and then needing to write, and then uh, remembering we read something that we need to use and digging back through everything we've already uh, read and not being able to find the information we need and being under a lot of pressure to do that. And in my experience, that creates a lot of the uh, errors in citation that reviewers catch and co-authors catch. And so I hope that the system that I'm explaining will help prevent those uh, most common errors that I see in citation. And I want to start with the basic question of why you need to cite, because um, this is something we do often without thinking about. And if we're thinking about why we need to cite when we're reading, it helps us organize the citation process for later. So the, the number one reason that we need to cite is because we don't know everything ourselves and we haven't done all the research ourselves. And so we cite other people to confer authority on our words when we make claims about things that we ourselves aren't the expert on. And I want to first sort citations, uh, and this is what I do in my mind when I read, I want to first sort citations into the sections of scientific papers that we usually find them. And we find citations always in the background or introduction sections of our scientific paper. And uh, we also find them in our methods sections, and we usually find them in our discussion sections where they serve three different purposes. Uh, number one purpose in introduction is often to provide background information or facts. For example, when we're establishing why it's important to be studying a particular disease in a particular place, and we want to give prevalence statistics, and we didn't actually conduct the studies that determine prevalence. So we cite other authorities, and those authorities provide us with the expertise to make the claims that we're making to back up everything in our paper. In the methods section, when we cite, we are usually citing to back up our methods. So when we say we did this, uh, the way Smith et al. did this, and you can get more details on our method from their paper. Those are often the key citations in method sections. In discussion sections, we're often interpreting our work in terms of the work of other people. And so what we're doing is we're using citations for interpretation. We'll often cite the studies we're interpreting in the background section, in the introduction, when we are describing the current state of the field and then use those studies and refer to those studies again in the discussion section when we're comparing our results to the results of other studies. And so as I'm reading, when I'm looking for material that I may cite, I am already sorting it in my head into these three different categories and keeping track of that in my note-taking program and my bibliographic program, which I'll talk about shortly. So you're gonna confer authority and you're gonna introduce the relevant studies in your work. And the relevant studies, what are those? Uh, there are studies that inspired yours, other people's work that you're building on. 
There's studies that you will advance upon. People could only go so far and you are advancing the field by doing the next thing. Studies that you're going to compare your results to and studies whose results contradicted yours so that you can explain the differences in that. And again, when I'm taking notes, I'm already sorting studies into these categories or potential categories in my mind. I often get asked, when do you or don't you need to cite? And this is particularly true for uh, early career researchers and graduate students who are, are unsure. And actually, the, the pressure to cite varies from culture to culture. And so I am talking now about uh, citation policies when you're citing in uh, scientific journals, which are mainly influenced by Western standards of citation. And uh, first of all, I'll tell you when you don't need to cite. You don't need to cite other people when you are referring to things that are common knowledge, things that everyone knows. Cancer kills a lot of people. And if you're gonna make a claim that cancer is a terrible disease that people suffer from and uh, that it creates a burden on, the, on, their, on caretakers and on patients, that is a broad enough claim in medicine that you do not need to have a citation for that. If you're giving prevalence statistics or cancer rates in a particular region, you do need to cite because you may not have done that research and you may be referring to other people's data. But common knowledge is something you don't need a citation for. And I get asked a lot, how do I know whether this is common knowledge or not? And the answer to that is you really have to look at your field and your audience. So common knowledge is going to differ from field to field. And so if you're crossing fields when you're making, uh, when you're writing an article and uh, for example, you're writing an interdisciplinary article, but you're publishing in the journal of one discipline and what you're saying might be common knowledge in the other discipline, if it's not common knowledge for both disciplines that you're writing towards, you need to cite. So that's a question you need to ask yourself. What can I expect my entire audience to already know? And you don't have to cite anything that you can expect your entire audience to already know. But beyond that, you must cite. So you need to cite when you make any claim that is not backed up by your own authority and research that has any kind of specific details to it. And the other time you always need to cite is when you refer to another person's words or ideas. And so if someone gave you an idea for something, uh, it's very important that you mention where you got this idea from. And one of the reasons this is important is because scientific publications are part of a conversation between scientists. And science is built on a kind of lineage of one experiment building on another and building on another. And one scientist advancing a theory and other scientists uh, supporting or contradicting that theory and at, to be part of this conversation and to acknowledge the gains that you got from other people's work, you need to cite uh, the person whose ideas or words you are referring to, whether or not you're referring to them exactly or quoting them specifically. Who and what should you cite? We often have restrictions on the number of citations in a given paper. And so we don't wanna have 150 citations, even though after a, you know, several years of working in a subject, we might actually have read that many papers. It's not a contest to figure out you know, who, who has read the most work. And it's not about bragging rights to what you know. It's about supporting, strategically supporting the claims that you're making when you cite. And so 
Um, one of the things that you need to do, and this is particularly important if you are a graduate student or a junior researcher, and you are handed, for example, an EndNote library by senior colleagues, is not everyone keeps their EndNote libraries up to date. And so you need to check and make sure that when you are supporting a claim, and again, I'll use prevalence statistics for this, that the person who gave you the EndNote library may not have looked up new prevalence statistics since 2020, but it's 2023 now, and you need to check and see if there's a more recent statistic if you're talking about prevalence today. And so you wanna cite the most recent sources for any kind of data that is timely. And uh, this is one of the things that I see scholars get tripped up on because they think, oh, I can save time and use this existing EndNote library. And reviewers will inevitably catch it when you're not tight as citing the most recent statistics. Um, you other, the other time you want to be careful about getting very recent sources is when you're documenting the current state of knowledge. In your introduction in most scientific papers, you're going to summarize the current state of the field. And you don't want to leave the state of the field hanging in 2018 when you're writing your article in 2023. So you have to be very careful, particularly when you're selecting the studies that you're going to cite and then compare your results to, that you have included the most recent study. A very common reviewer uh, comment that I see come back is there are two more recent studies since you, uh, from you know after the last study that you cited, why aren't they included in the article? And so your job becomes to check and make sure and update the EndNote library of whoever sent it to you. Make sure that you've got the most recent statistics and sources for your citation. You also want to cite the most credible authorities. And sometimes, quite a lot of the time when we're doing scientific research, the authority of uh, the work increases as more work has been done. And so people conduct preliminary studies and then they conduct confirmatory studies and then they go on. And we don't wanna get stuck citing a pilot study when there's actually a completed randomized control trial that we could cite. So cite the most credible authorities with the most recent studies to support your claims. And any claims you make are going to be based either on previous work or on deducing from previous work plus your current results. So unless you make that lineage clear in your paper with citations, your reviewers and your readers will be confused about how you know what you say you know. And we also wanna cite the most credible authorities when we're creating evidence for arguments. And we often see this in discussions when we take our results and then we combine them with the results of other people to create and strengthen the evidence we present for the conclusion that we are arguing for. So tracking all of this and keeping uh, your bibliographic sources up to date, your reference uh, managers up to date with the most recent items for your work is crucially important. And you should not wait until right before you have to write the paper to do that. That should be part of an ongoing work that you're doing as a researcher in your field. And you have to cite all studies to which you refer. And I occasionally see this, I mention this only because I do occasionally see people mention, mentioning Smith et al and forgetting to put the citation actually into the bibliography. And so you just wanna make sure that you count down and track your citations against all the studies that you have been referring to. And this always brings us to the question of how you should manage and track your sources. And you should absolutely keep track of what you read and take notes on it and sort and organize those notes as you go, instead of having to dig back six months or even a year and a half to two years later, because I don't know about you, I have a very good memory. 
but I still don't remember everything I read a year and a half ago as clearly as I would like. And so we all need to choose and use our citation managers. And my feeling about this, having used all of them and probably 30 of them over the last, you know, since they were invented, is that the best citation manager for you is the one you use regularly. If you hate EndNote and all of your colleagues use it, you must learn to use EndNote. But if you don't want to add new citations to EndNote and it drives you mad to use it, then go ahead and export your EndNote citations into Zotero or Mendeley or whatever program you like and make sure that you keep them up to date in parallel, one to please your colleagues and cite in your papers because they demand you use EndNote, for example, and one because you just enjoy using this other citation manager. And I actually have up-to-date citation uh, collections in all three of these different citation managers at the same time. And I keep them automatically, all three of them up to date. And it makes switching back and forth when I'm working with different colleagues an easy thing for me to do. So the best citation manager, as usually is the case with the best software, is the one that you will use consistently. Um, and uh, the other part of tracking and managing sources is not just tracking the citations, but annotating the PDFs and taking notes on these PDFs. And some citation managers allow you to do that within the program. There are others that are PDF annotators. And again, you can use Evernote, DevonThink, Zotero, Obsidian, anything that makes you happy as long as you use it consistently. And there are combination programs. I have really liked Zotero ever since I've started working in it because I find it meets all my needs. DevonThink is also wonderful that way. I can import my uh, PDFs and annotate them and have it connected to my citation manager and everything works perfectly, but it's expensive. And Zotero, unless you're going to use the online storage is free. And so you should choose, again, choose what you use. And so combination programs are great if you can get them. Whatever you're going to use, you need to develop a framework for preserving the memory of notes, quotes, and paraphrases so that you don't confuse them with each other and so that you uh, don't lose them and when you're trying to look them up uh, you know, later. And so what I always do is I start, when I start researching in a new area or I start reading papers in a new area, I start to develop a subject or a category or a tag index. Some programs allow you to do this um, within the program. And uh, I often use AI and full text search software on my own notes. This is very different from using, for example, chat GPT to write the parts of your paper where you're citing. That is not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is using a program like DevonThink, for example, or Obsidian that may have AI embedded within them to search your own notes and to create cloud tags and uh, index hierarchies and concept maps. And I'm often asked, what is the difference between quotation, paraphrasing, and plagiarism? And one of the reasons that it's important to say this uh, repeatedly is because different cultures have different practices with this. In most of the Western scientific journals, they keep a very distinct difference between quotation, paraphrase, and plagiarism. So you need to cite when you quote or you paraphrase. A quotation is an extract directly from the source without changing it. So if there's a particular uh, three word phrase to, or three word plus phrase that you're using directly from another author or even a two word key term that they invented and you think is a great phrase and you're going to use it, that needs to go inside quotation marks because you're actually lifting text from one source 
and putting it into your own paper. So that's what we call a quotation, and those must always go within quotation marks and be cited. Paraphrasing gets fuzzy for people. And my favorite explanation of paraphrasing is when you explain other people's thoughts, words, or ideas in your own language. So even in those cases, when you have taken something from someone else and completely rephrased it, if the concept or idea or thought originated with another person, you must cite that person. Failure to cite in either instance is plagiarism. So this is why it's so important to remember where you got ideas from when you take notes, because even if you forget where you got an idea from, you'd be amazed how many of your reviewers will say, hey, wait a minute, that came from that paper. So to protect yourself, you need to keep track. And that's why I suggest you use your bibliography and your note-taking programs to track your quotes and your paraphrases. And I'll remind you, my final slide here is to read everything you cite. We're very busy people. We get citation libraries. Colleagues say, oh, this will back up this point you're making and send us papers. But under the ICMJE rules for authorship, all authors are responsible for each or any incorrect citation in their manuscripts. And so uh, you'll need to check every library and every individual citation that other people give you. Because one of the things that I often see is an article someone sends a writer doesn't actually say what the colleague remembers or thought it said. And sometimes this is as simple as they have an EndNote library of 500 sources and they clicked on one when they meant to click on the one below it and they sent you the wrong source. So if you don't check on that, no one will catch it till it gets to the reviewers and the reviewers will go, hey, wait a minute, the source has nothing to do with what you said. So you need to check that. So your colleague may have mistakenly supplied the wrong source or they may have misremembered what was in a source or sources might be out of date. And again, that's the most important reason, I think, for really checking your libraries over. If there's an older article, is there a newer one that you can replace it with? And the, the final thing that's important here is that when you're editing and you're cutting and pasting in Microsoft Word, if you're not very careful, you can also have citations that wander back and forth. And so a citation that was at the end of one sentence might get cut and pasted and wind up at the end of another sentence it has nothing to do with. And so you need to make sure you check each one of those citations before you go to press. Thanks very much for listening and please post your questions to the chat or feel free to ask them out loud.